Increase the value to my home. Call 833-LEAF-FILTER or go to GetLeafFilter.com for your free gutter inspection and estimate. Call or log on today and save 15%. After a week-long break, all eyes back on the courtroom in Fairfax County, Virginia, as Amber Heard got back on the stand to continue telling her story. You never forget the first time someone hits you like that. Nothing I did changed his rage at me. Nothing I did changed the violence towards me. Breaking down on the stand, telling the jury what she wants. I don't want anything from him. Just don't call me a liar. It's all I said. Just don't call me a liar. Johnny Depp and his attorney standing by, waiting anxiously for cross-examination to begin. The man you beat up numerous times. <laughs> right, Ms. Hurt? I could never hurt Johnny. This hour, we are live in Fairfax County, Virginia, with all the big moments and all the big drama in Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. <laughs> I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Wow, what a day. Everyone back in front of their TVs around the nation watching Amber Heard continue her testimony. We'll get to the testimony. We'll get to the cross-examination. But I want to begin tonight with a line from legendary singer-songwriter Neil, Neil Sedaka. Breaking up is hard to do. It certainly is. I mean, anyone who's been through that knows that. How difficult it is, the emotional investment, and then when you break up, it's just, it gets ugly. It gets nasty. It's emotionally draining. Sometimes it's potentially dangerous. But everyone knows that it, it's awful, absolutely awful. Now, for Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, when you've got TMZ and everyone else in the world reporting on it because of who you are, it becomes even more difficult. Now, there's nothing wrong with TMZ and friends reporting on all the, the troubles between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard because, that's, you know, they're public people. You know, you, you live in that spotlight. You invite the cameras into your life. You invite all the publicity that you need to become famous and to have successful movies. When things go south, the same cameras and microphones will be there to capture it all. But that makes it incredibly more difficult because it's so public what is going on now in, in this case amber heard 2018 writing that washington post uh, op-ed then became the, the face or attempted to become the face of me too which took this broken relationship which was already in the spotlight to the next level and and it it, it it took it to a different place because you have to remember where we were in this country back in 2018, this seismic shift in how people, um, men, were, were losing jobs, losing opportunities because of what they had done. And now Amber Heard making those accusations about Johnny Depp. And from Johnny Depp's perspective, basically Amber sunk his ship. It was over. His career, those big blockbusters, ended once she said, yeah, uh, me too, you know, me too. I'm, I'm the face of, of, of being a survivor. And that's what this trial is all about. Now, we've heard a lot, and I've explained a lot from Johnny Depp's perspective. He's the plaintiff in the case. He's the one who brought the case. He's the one who initiated this litigation, this lawsuit. So that's why it's important to understand his perspective and, and why he's doing what he's doing, right? Very public breakup. She claims to be a victim of, of domestic violence. He says that destroys his career, so he files the lawsuit. Now, there are counterclaims by Amber Heard now, so they're, you know, he's suing her and she is suing him right back. But interesting, today I think we, we, we learned, or at least Amber Heard gave an explanation as to what she really, really wants. And he came from the witness stand uh, during her direct examination, explaining almost a mindset of, okay, you, this is a broken relationship, but where is that relationship now? Why are we, why does, why does this trial exist? What does she want out of it? We kind of know what Johnny wants out of it. He wants to get his name back, et cetera. 
But take a listen to, to this part of her testimony because I think it's really significant today. And, and for the first time we're hearing Amber Heard, yes, she described everything that happened during this tumultuous relationship, but here she is describing like from her own perspective what she wants. <laughs> I don't want to call myself a victim. I don't like to think of myself as a victim, and I don't want him to think I'm attacking him or blaming him. I'm pointing out I didn't cooperate with the police, that I didn't want to get him in trouble, that I didn't want to hurt him. I don't want anything from him. Just don't call me a liar. It's all I said. Just don't call me a liar. Just don't say this isn't real. Because I'm the walking proof of it. I'm, I'm, I just wanted him to leave me alone. I wanted to move on with my life. And he won't let me. By making statements like this, he won't let me. I have to be here today. I have to be reliving it every single time. He, with these statements, with these, these, these leaks, these comments, once again, makes me have to speak to the most horrifying things I've lived through. It's torture. It's torturous. I want you to have to do that. I want to move on with my life. I have a baby. I want to move on. I want to move on. I want Johnny to move on, too. Leave me alone. To me, that speaks volumes about, you know, she wants to move on. He's like, well, I can't move on because my life's been ruined. So I want to uh, rectify what happened. They're in, they're, to this day, they're in two completely different places. Johnny, anything but wants to move on. He wants to get back. She wants to move on and move past it all. And, and there you see it playing out in front of this jury inside the courtroom. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who is joining us live from Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, Chanley, great to see you. This, this was, to me, she was speaking really almost about her counterclaim up there. Can, can you give us, because we focus so much on Johnny Depp and his lawsuit. We're in Amber's case now, and she has a counterclaim. Let's kind of you know, clear that up a little bit for, for everyone tonight. Yeah, so during her case in chief, not only does she have to defend against Johnny Depp's defamation suit against her, but she has to put on proof of her counterclaim. She fired back after he filed a defamation against her with a three-count counterclaim. Two of those counts were dismissed by a judge, but the defamation counts still survive, and there's three particular statements that are at issue, and she was questioned on those statements today on direct examination as part of her proof, and basically uh, saying that Adam Waldman, who was an attorney or an agent of Johnny Depp at the time after this lawsuit was filed, started saying things to the media in 2020, particularly in April and in June 2020, about her allegations being this fake hoax that she came up with fake sexual violence allegations, that this was an ambush on Johnny Depp, that the May 2016 incident was a setup by her and her friends. They're the ones that spilt the wine everywhere, destroyed everything to set up Johnny Depp. He was lured there, and he goes on to call it an abuse hoax, and that caused her emotional distress, according to Amber Heard, and, of course, injured her reputation and her career, but let's listen to her talk about one of those statements that took place in April 2020. It says, Adam Waldman, Depp's lawyer, said afterwards, Amber Heard and her friends in the media use fake sexual violence allegations as both a sword and a shield, depending on their needs. They have selected some of her sexual violence hoax facts as the sword, inflicting them on the public and Mr. Depp. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, is this a true or a false statement? <laughs> false. A and why is it false? Well, you know, I have to use, to, to use what I've lived through and, 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 and what I've survived, calling it fake, saying that, that I'm, I'm harming 
Johnny with this. I'm harming the public with this. This is what I've lived through. And to, to say that it's a hoax, that these aren't even real things, I, I, I mean, <laughs> after everything I've, I've lived through and survived, and also I hadn't even spoken about the sexual abuse within my marriage. I hadn't, I had been protective of that. I didn't want to talk about that ever. Adam Waldman was the one who put that out in the world. As remarkable as that is, I hadn't, I, I had protected that. I had to go to another country to give testimony and thankfully they allowed me to do so with confidentiality and some protection. And then Johnny, through his lawyer, not only uses that against me, but says it's a hoax. She's referring there, of course, to the UK trial against the Sun, where she testified about the sexual violence in confidence without cameras or media presence in that trial. And of course, that was in 2020 uh, fall. So she's talking about the statement coming out in April 2020, where she had not been public with the sexual violence allegations. But however, the title of her op ed in 2018, the online version, Vinny, remember, said, I spoke out against sexual violence and endured the wrath, the culture's wrath of that. So there's arguments both sides here on exactly when she came out with the allegations of sexual violence. Was it motivated by the op-ed or by the lawsuit? Or did Adam Waldman even know about it? If he, if he knew about it, then it would have been a hoax. She would have made it up because he already knew. So it's a point back and forth. And she was trying to insinuate there to the jury that how would he know? about these allegations if I hadn't said them publicly yet. Yeah, this is, you think about the, the claims and the counterclaims in this case, it all comes down to credibility, really, of Amber Heard, right? I mean, that, that's what is on trial right now, is whether or not the allegations she made were true and, and whether or not she's a liar. That is the basis of Johnny's claim. That's the basis of her claim. So that's ultimately what this entire trial is about. So the testimony of Amber Heard can go a long way. If the jury doesn't believe her, what she's saying in court, they certainly may not believe the allegations that she made. And if they do believe her, well, maybe they will believe those allegations. So the big test, though, always, as we know in every trial, for credibility of any witness comes down to cross-examination. And that began today. Describe the, the, the courtroom itself, the mood, et cetera, and then some of the cross-examination today. It's been highly anticipated four days now, of course, day three of her on the stand. And it was after the mid-afternoon break, so we made sure we were in there in time. And then there was this really long sidebar, and that just built the anticipation even more, right, Vinny, inside the courtroom. And so the jury enters, Camille Vasquez, the one who's been objecting, objecting on direct, started off. And she began uh, really trying to hold Amber's feet to the fire. It was, at times, a rapid-fire type of questioning, but no raised voices. As I sat in the courtroom in the gallery, it at times seemed argumentative and, and contentious back and forth, but it didn't seem overly so where there were raised voices that it would maybe take you aback. But the way she started was an interesting way to address what everyone has been noticing throughout Amber Heard being on the witness stand and the jury too, why Johnny Depp keeps his head down most of the time. Let's watch. Mr. Depp hasn't looked at you once this entire trial, has he? Not that I've noticed, no. You've looked at him, though, many times, haven't you? Yes, I have. You know exactly why Mr. Depp won't look back at you, don't you? I do. He promised you he would never, you would never see his eyes again. Isn't that true? I don't recall if he said that. Then Camille went on to play an audio from 2016 Vinny in July, that San Francisco meetup after they had filed for, filed for divorce, separated. Uh, there was this restraining order, but she wanted to meet with him. During that recording is when he makes this promise that he would not ever look her in the eye again. And he seems to be fulfilling that inside the courtroom. It's, it's an unbelievable turnaround because it was one of those things like this is kind of strange. He's not looking at her. What will the jury take away? And then they begin this they, with the explanation. They put it right in front of the jury. <laughs> Another amazing moment in this case. 
Chandler Painter, uh, we'll check back with you in just a little bit. I want to bring in a special guest joining us tonight in Alexandria, Virginia, New York Times bestselling author of the book, You Can't Lie to Me, retired ATF investigator, world-renowned body language expert, Janine Driver, back with us. And you can check her out on TikTok at Body Language Institute. Okay, Janine, great to see you. I have a, um, a bit of the cross-examination I want to play for you and get your take, your reaction, what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Uh, let's watch. And you said to Mr. Depp, quote, you can tell, you can please tell people that it was a fair fight and see what the jury and the judge think. Tell the world, Johnny, tell them Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, a victim too of domestic violence, end quote. That's what you said, right? I was saying it to the man who beat me up, yes. I thought it was preposterous. And the man you beat up numerous times. <laughs> right, Ms. Heard? I could never hurt Johnny. All right, what are you seeing? Okay, first of all, Vinny, we see a five second eye close. She does this five second eye close. This is an instrumental with detecting deception. We had Chris Watts murdered his pregnant wife, Shanann, and his two young daughters, Celeste and Bella. He did a 1.5 second eye close. If I asked everyone at home watching to close your eyes for 1.5 seconds, while listening or talking, you'll see how dramatic it is. Amber does five seconds. Scott Peterson murdered his wife, pregnant also. Two second eye close. Then we have nine seconds, Ted Bundy. So he, she is between a, a Scott Peterson and a Ted Bundy here. This is indicative of people. It's like, a, 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 I say it's like a screensaver on your cell phone. That screensaver comes up so you don't see my private information that I don't want you to have access to. So she's telling us she doesn't want us to have access to it. That's number one. Number two, Vinny. She uses minimizing language. Amber says, I could never hurt Johnny. That's future tense, not I didn't hurt him. And hurt instead of the question was not about hurting. It was about what? You know, abuse. This is about domestic violence. Jerry Sandusky said, I didn't do these things instead of saying I didn't molest these kids. Uh, R. Kelly said, quit playing. I didn't do this stuff. When people are lying, Vinny, and you at home, I want you to understand they'll use minimizing language. These things, this stuff, or hurt, I would never, I could never hurt Johnny instead of abuse Johnny. Guess why this is significant? Because Johnny Depp on the stand said what? People are saying I'm a wife beater. He uses the language. It is unlikely that a truthful person would say wife beater. We get Johnny on the stand giving us what's indicative of a truthful person. We've got Amber doing the opposite. Okay, Janine Driver staying with us this hour. When we come back, we've got a lot more to get to, including um, May 21st, 2016. We keep coming back to May 21st, 2016. The cell phone incident. This is the one that resulted in the restraining order. More testimony, more analysis when we come back.
Proper fit. And then he starts talking about the feces again and this prank that he said one of my friends had left for him in my bed that he wasn't going to be at. And I tried to point out how that didn't make any sense. I'm not even going to be there. I wasn't there. And my friends wouldn't do that. That's not something a bunch of 30-year-old women think is funny. What is he talking about? Okay, back to the fecal matter um, in the bed. Th this, is, this is the basis, apparently, for th the big blow up on May 21st, 2016. It all starts with what's left in the bed. Did little Boo the dog do it, or did Amber or one of her friends do it? That's, that's the question, right? Um, let's take a listen to Amber Heard testifying today about her version of what went down May 21st, 2016. I mean, just screamed at I.O. Um, some really nasty stuff. And he, when he was done, he says, you know, you want to, you want to have, you want to have my woman now. You want to have my bitch. You can have, you, you take her, you can have her. And he, with that, picks up, just pulls his arm back with the phone and throws it at my face. Hit me right in my, it felt like my, my eye. <sighs> I put my head in my hands and immediately start crying. Um, I said, you hit me with the phone. Johnny, you hit me. And I'm sitting on the couch. I didn't even have time to react, you know? I, I didn't even have time to put my hands up. I was still sitting cross-legged in my socks on the couch. And I haven't seen him for a month and last you know, several times now that I've seen him, he's hit me and I didn't even have time to react to this. He comes over to me um, as I'm crying and he does that taunting thing to me. He says, oh yeah, I hit you, huh? I hit you, yeah? And he just feels like wax me on top of my head, just this heavy ringed hand landed on top of my my skull grabs me by the hair, yanks me up off the couch. I'm struggling to stand up. And um, I don't know if he was intending to um, hit me in the face or if he was just trying to grab my face, but he was making this um, gesture around my face to try to hold, to expose my face to him. And he was like, yeah, let me see how bad I hurt you. Let me see it. Let me see how bad I hurt you this time. What if I pull your hair back? What if I pull your hair back? And he yanks my hair back. I'm trying to prevent him from landing the blows to my face. I'm trying to prevent my face from being exposed. And I just remember this mocking taunt he was doing with me as he is yanking me around the room. And eventually throwing the cell phone in her face. Now, Johnny Depp has a different take on what happened and let's let's just review what Johnny Depp testified to in part about this same exact incident and then I took the phone and I just bang like that onto the I mean that side of the couch was eight feet long the other side of the couch is about six feet long I flopped it onto the couch. And then he left. So, um, you know, who's telling the truth? The jury's got to figure it out. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us tonight in New York City, family law attorney, managing partner, uh, matrimonial law firm Berkman, Botker, and Newman, and Shine. Jacqueline Newman is with us. In Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert, witness, and columnist, Dr. Carol Lieberman. And still with us in Alexandria, Virginia, New York Times bestselling author of the book, You Can't Lie to Me, retired ATF investigator, world-renowned body language expert, Janine Driver, still with us. Of course, check her out at, uh, on TikTok at Body Language Institute. Jacqueline Newman, let me ask you something. Couples, they break up all the time. They have fights, a lot of fights. A lot of times are the fights about stupid things, like ridiculous, like who 
left what in the bed? I don't know how many I've had that about leaving certain things in the bed that we're talking about here. But that said, yes, in answer to your question, most of these are really about stupid things because it's not really about what people are fighting about. It's about the principle of what they're fighting about. And sometimes it's just about the fight and it's about being right, even if they don't really have to be right about the exact thing they're fighting about. Dr. Carol Lieberman, it, it, you know, this Two completely different versions, right? Uh, I, 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 we've been seeing it throughout the entire trial. But getting back to this, this, this whatever happened in that bed, uh, she is saying on the one hand, there's no way we would do that. And he's saying, well, it was, it was human. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a teacup Yorkie. Like, what is, what is, what are we to think of all of this? This, this literal <laughs> mess. The doggy ate my homework and then and then defecated in the bed. You know, today was um, an amazing day. It was uh, waiting to exhale. You know, we have been listening for days to her testimony. Uh, many of us have been questioning it. You know, feeling like we're being lied to. Um, and, and feeling frustrated, like, when are you going to tell the truth? And today, finally, on cross, you know, we saw the beginning of things that where she was proven to actually have lied. And there's something very satisfying in that. Now, in regard to the dogs, um, you know, it, it, it it's just one more ridiculous kind of lie, really. Um, because from what Johnny had said, that it was bigger than, than Yorkie poo. <laughs> and, um, Teacup Yorkie, and, big difference. Teacup Yorkie. Teacups are like exactly. four pounds. Regular Yorkie could be, you know, 12, 13 pounds. That's right. Good point. So, um, you know, it's just one of the more, I guess, uh, humorous um, lies. But but this whole thing, I mean, there's nothing really humorous about all of it. It's just really other than to say that it's good that finally we are seeing uh, the truth being stripped away. I mean, the, the lies being stripped away and seeing really good questions, cross-examination questions to show that there are so many things that they have. This is like we've just seen the beginning. There are so many things where they can prove that um, she was lying. Let me ask you, Jadine Driver, there were two versions. You know, we played the shorter versions of them, obviously, but two different versions of, of this May 21st. To me, it's such a significant date because this is the one, uh, it's at the, towards the end, it's the one that uh, results in her getting the temporary restraining order. Um, did you see or hear anything from, from Amber Heard or Johnny Depp in the way they described what was happening there? There's a lot going on here, Vinny, Vinny, as you might imagine. And there's something that we talk about in the law enforcement world called Miller's Law. And one of the parts of Miller's Law is, can you put yourself in the story? When someone is telling the story, can we get ourselves in the story? If we can't, then we look at you as not being as credible. When Johnny's telling the story, he's showing himself, throwing the phone. And this gesture, they're called illustrators, is congruent with what he's saying in truthful people, the gesture comes a half a second before the word. So if I said to you, call me or check please at the restaurant, we're seeing this congruent with Johnny. When Amber tells the story, her illustrator is almost an after effect. She's first demonstrating as if she's Johnny. So she's playing the role of Johnny with the throwing of the phone. And then as an afterthought, she's like, oh, and it hit me in the head. It just comes across as incongruent. And I think the jury we have in our brain called an N400, where our brain is going to say, does this make sense? I'm just feeling like it's just off or bad acting. So, uh, Jacqueline, how important do all the other witnesses come now? Because we're hearing about other people that are sort of integrated in their lives up at the penthouse, whoever's living there. If I'm on that jury, I want to hear from all these folks. When it comes to what happened in the bed, we did hear from the, 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 the driver who said that she indicated it was a prank. Today, she said that was not a prank. Um, so we're going to have to hear from other people that support her version of this Otherwise, I think the jury's going to obviously uh, believe his version of who of wh who left what in that bed.
Absolutely. I mean, you know, they're going to be looking mostly at Johnny and Amber. I mean, I think that that's the juries. Those are the main players in this case. That said, I agree. The secondary players who support the supporting actors, shall we say, are really going to be the ones who I think are going to help out Amber. And as of right now, she's going to need the help. I think right now she's not believable. And I think that unless she brings somebody on who really is going to ultimately steal the show and put her in a position where the jury is going to want to believe her, she's got a tough, tough hill to climb. Interesting twist today. When we come back, we're going to talk about this. Um, Amber Heard talking about Johnny Depp's injuries. Self-inflicted. Saying he has a history of self-inflicted injuries. We'll play for you the testimony, and then our experts will break down the truth.
ever witnessed Mr. Depp uh, self-injuring himself? Uh, often. He did that often. Big development today. Amber Heard finishing up her direct examination and uh, I guess coming up with an explanation for some of the injuries that we've seen on Johnny Depp in some of the photos throughout the course of this trial. Now claiming Johnny Depp is self-inflicting these injuries. Let's take a listen to a little bit more. I almost called 911 in New York in 2014, August of 2014, I believe, um, because I thought he had done himself an injury. He often, in fights, would cut his arms um, or hold a knife to his chest or um, draw blood superficially, superficially at first, but uh, later, like in 2016, especially as our relationship was ending. Um, oh, he also put cigar cigarettes out on himself. Um, he'd flick them at me um, and once or twice tried to put one out on me, but mostly he would do it while screaming at me. Uh, he once did it right in front of me, screaming um, at, at my face as he as he put the cigarette out on his cheek. Let's bring back in our guests still with us: uh, Jacqueline Newman, family law attorney; Carol Lieberman, forensic psychiatrist; and Janine Driver, body language expert. Dr. Carol Lieberman, uh, what type of person um, engages in this type of behavior, this self-infliction of wounds, who's in a relationship? Well, a lot of times what that can mean is that they are in pain, which indeed Johnny Depp was. I mean, she was incredibly abusive to him, not only physically, but emotionally. So we know he was in pain during their relationship. And so sometimes people will um, self-harm in order to, because they're in so much pain and they want to sort of um, make it seem real in terms of physical pain as to take away from the emotional pain. Also, sometimes people do that in relationships as in an effort to not hurt the other person. They hurt themselves instead. That's so, what I was going to ask you. How common is it for someone who hurts, if, if someone is harming themselves, to then abuse their partner right. as well? No, it is not. That That's almost some, something that shows that he wouldn't be hurting his partner. All right, Janine Driver, uh, your thoughts about this part of the testimony? Well, we are seeing disgust in here. It's scorn because it's a combination of anger and disgust again. We've seen this on Amber's face before, and we're not seeing fear. So she's saying that he tried to do this to her a couple times, but we don't see fear. Instead, we're seeing this scorn, this 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 anger. We saw this on Cato Kalin's face, uh, face when he was cross-examined by Marsha Clark about a book deal or a movie deal. He was like, uh, it's like you explicit, it, right? It's like with that B word right here. And so we see that instead of fear. And I and I know you are on a time crunch. And I have to say this earlier, I forgot the smoking gun when he, she threw the gun. I mean, when she said he threw the, the phone, she said this, hit me, hit me, felt like my eye. And I, I, I was remiss to not mention this earlier. Felt like my eye is not he hit my eye. In law enforcement, this would be very sus suspicious. So sorry to go back to that point, but I had to do it. I told you a couple nights ago, when there's a kinda, there's more to find a. I should have said, when there's a like or a kinda, there's more to find a. So th that's a backstory for the last piece of segment here. Yeah, gotcha. No no apology necessary. We want we want folks at home to hear as much as you you have that we that we can we can talk about. Let's take a listen now to Amber Heard. Uh, here testifying uh, again, talking about the nature of this relationship. Client admits to history of anxiety, eating disorder, attention deficit disorder, bipolar disorder, codependence issues, and occasional insomnia. When have you had an eating disorder? I've never had an eating disorder. When have you been diagnosed with bipolar disorder? I've never been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. When have you been diagnosed with codependence issues? I have never been diagnosed with codependency issues, although arguably at the time from where I, well, at, from where I stand now, I can see that the relationship I was in with, with Johnny was certainly codependent. Okay, Dr. Carol Lieberman, tell us a little bit about codependency and are you seeing it in this relationship? Well, codependency is when um, 
you are so in needy of the other person's attention and, and affection and so on that um, you go along with things that are not healthy. Um, but you know what I think is is really interesting. Here she is. That was those were the nurse's notes, right? So she's throwing the nurse under the bus, saying that the nurse basically did something. I mean, that could be malpractice. You know, she doesn't seem to care that she's accusing the nurse of malpractice. She just throws her under the bus as she throws other people under the bus. Her lawyers under the bus later on when she said she gave them the photos, and I don't know what happened, right? She's uh, so she. No one is safe. Um, Jacqueline Newman, let me ask you, ultimately, I think this entire case, once again, I said this off the top, is about her, whether or not she's telling the truth, whether or not she's, her claim is based on it, his claim is based on it. So, um, you know, it's going to be like six weeks or whatever worth of testimony that this jury's going to have to sift through and figure out. But ultimately, that's, that's what this case is about, whether or not she's telling the truth about the relationship or not. No, I agree. And I think that, again, you know, I, I'm seeing this a little bit from the court of public opinion and just watching it as an attorney and also as a person. And I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling uh, to believe her. But I agree. I think that you have to realize, you know, part of the thing of a jury is they're a jury of your peers and they're, you know, they're people and they're going to be looking at her probably the same way. So while they're not a lawyers, I think the lawyers here, um, you know, especially I think Johnny Depp's lawyer today on cross did a fantastic job. And I think that, you know, the jury's going to take that very, very seriously. And I'm curious to see what tomorrow brings. Jeanine Driver, let me ask you another question. And, and have you seen in, in your, in studying body language or anything else, are there people who are just awkward and unlikable mm -hmm. that come across and, and give these clues but aren't, but are telling the truth? Or yes, is, is there a hundred percent? Because I think we're getting yes, a little bit of a vibe that people just don't like her. Some people don't know why they don't like her. But it, well, it, are they always connected? Vinny, this is step one. There is no body language that, that someone lights their you know, pants are on fire and their nose grows as much as TikTok would like us to believe that to be I the case. I saw that one. You, you have to get your baseline. And when the baseline changes, that's a hot spot. And, and you know, Dr. Lieberman, I'm sure, can attest as well, because I know she talks about body language as well, is, is we're looking for clusters. We're looking for the change in the baseline. I have looked at... Every interview I could find, hours and hours of Amber going into this. So this is a change in her baseline, especially her looking at the jury. I think this is going to not serve her well. If I'm a, a guest on the Today Show or on Rachel Ray or Dr. Oz, I'm looking at Dr. Oz as he's talking to me. I may gesture a little bit to the, to the audience, but you're looking at the person who's asking the question. And her constantly looking at the jury, I think is going to be a huge disservice to her. It's almost like we say in law enforcement, the, uh, Joe Navarro, a retired FBI agent, came up with this, and I love it. Truthful people convey, liars try to convince. She's trying to oversell. It's against her baseline. It's not who she is. And not only that, here we see shoulder shrugs. And I had predicted this last week with you, Vinny, or the week before, that when she was on cross, look for the shoulder shrugs. A shoulder shrug is uncertainty. We saw many of them today. We're going to see more tomorrow, and the next day of cross continues. A shoulder shrug is uncertainty. What do you want for lunch? I don't know. It belongs there. But when I give you a definitive answer, no, I've not been diagnosed. No, I've never done this. This is telling me the opposite. You're saying yes or no, but your body language is not congruent. You're telling me there's something you're uncertain about. If someone says to you, yeah, I'd love to go out with you again. It doesn't mean they don't want to go out with you again. Maybe they're just about to travel for work. You've opened a file cabinet in a file they're uncertain about. If you ask me if I cheated on my ex-husband, I said, did I cheat? No, it doesn't mean I'm a cheater. Maybe he cheated. Maybe my best friend's cheating on her significant other. You've opened a file I'm uncertain about and I don't want to share with you. There's information here she doesn't want to share with us. We don't know what it is. All right. Janine Driver, Dr. Carol Lieberman, Jacqueline Newman, thank you so much. Appreciate your valuable time, your insight. It, it helps us out each and every night. We'll talk again. When we come back, we're going to bring back in Shanley Painter to take a look at what was happening, uh, some of the things that the jury did not see today.
Com. You testified that this is a picture you took after that incident, right, Ms. Hurd? Yes, that was one where he grabbed me. And hit you in the face so many times that you don't remember. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And there's no injuries to your face in this picture, are there? Not that this picture shows. And there's no medical records reflecting that you sought treatment after this alleged incident either. I did not seek medical treatment at this time. So there's no medical records reflecting any injuries to your face after he, he hit you several times. I did not need to go to the doctor at the time. Despite hitting you several times that you lost count with rings on, your fi on his fingers. That's correct. I did not seek medical attention. Some of the cross-examination from today. Hey, next hour, coming up in a few minutes, uh, we're going to go through that cross-examination piece by piece, so make sure you stay with us. In the meantime, I want to bring back in Court TV uh, legal correspondent, Chanley Painter, who is outside the courthouse in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. All right, what was it like outside the court this morning? Off for a week, um, did people forget about the trial? <laughs> Absolutely not, Vinny. The most fans showed up today than ever before in anticipation of the cross-examination of Amber Heard on the stand. In fact, the very first two people in line, a mother and son, Vinny, showed up 24 hours before the wristband handout. Here's a look at what it was like this morning around 7 a.m. when the deputies come out, set up a table, and they wristband the first 100 people get inside the courtroom. The next 50 are in the overflow courtroom. And again, I talked to a man today. He got in line at 3 o'clock yesterday on Sunday, Vinny, and was still number 15 in line. And it's just incredible to see how this has built over the last few weeks that week off just gave more people time to plan to be here apparently uh today you can see some of them carrying their mats and sleeping bags uh, food in their bags and they have been out here all night and of course throughout the day uh, we also have this crowd on the other side of the courthouse too behind where johnny depp and amber heard arrive and depart every day that's also building as we progress so this morning johnny depp arrived to the most fans and the loudest fans we've heard so far i think we have that video if we want to take a look at him arriving today that's him departing i think we're checking on that here we go this is Amber Heard. Looks like she's uh, oh, there's arriving Amber. today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I don't I don't know if we have the sound. I don't hear the sound on that, but it's a distinct difference between her. Obviously, you can hear boos and jeers. There they are. When she arrives, and then of course here's Johnny Depp. Much different scene. Let's take a listen to what he says to our photographer Austin this morning. <laughs> So he was upbeat, as he always is, arriving this morning. He's always upbeat. And he was blaring Bob Marley, of course, every morning out of that SUV. We know that he spent the week off in Europe, Vinny, playing music, relaxing with friends. So he's back stateside and showing up extra early for court uh, today. Uh, so, again, we've caught up with those who waited outside for him. And majority still here today for Johnny Depp. Absolutely. How about um, outside after court today? After court today, I mean, it seemed like 150 to 200 people outside lining the street of uh, behind the courthouse waiting for the departure of Johnny Depp and, of course, Amber Heard. And there was even a thunderstorm this afternoon, late this afternoon here in Fairfax County, and that did not keep the crowds away. And you could hear the anticipation. Our alpaca friends were out there, Vinny. And we have, here it is, here he is right now, video of Johnny, he shakes everyone's hand and greets everyone as he departs. And not sure if there's audio to go with this, but it takes a while for the crowd on the other side of the gate to really notice him. And once they see him, that's what you hear right there. 
Look at that crowd. That crowd now is there's extra security, of course. Larger and larger yes. and larger. It's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Uh, they actually are threatened with arrest if they leave that sidewalk, Vinny. Okay. Got to keep them under control. Chanley Painter in Fairfax County, Virginia. <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll talk again. Wow. All right. When we come back, a lot more to get to tonight. We've got to take a look at that cross-examination piece by piece. Amber Heard, the accusations, do they match the pictures? That's next. In Fairfax County, Virginia, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. A huge day inside the courtroom with Amber Heard 
back on the stand. I was constantly doing a juggling act of what kind of version of Johnny I was dealing with. Can Amber prove she didn't lie? Can she win this case and the $100 million she countersued for? I don't want anything from him. Just don't call me a liar. It's all I said. Just don't call me a liar. Tonight, we break down her story. Will it hold up on cross-examination? You didn't think he would tell the world he was a victim of domestic violence, did you? I found it hard to believe that he could or that he would do that, considering the relationship he and I had. I, I thought it would be crazy for him to do so. And on the docket in Palm Beach County, Florida, the killer clown trial. Sheila Keen Warren accused of dressing up like a clown and killing Marlene Warren, then marrying her husband. There were apparently some pieces of evidence that they wanted to re-examine. Plus, Amber Heard putting lots of photographs into evidence today, including this one. So, tonight's 13th year question, what does this photograph prove to you. Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. I'm Betty Politan. Thanks so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And let me tell you, this trial is about one thing and one thing only. It's about Amber Heard. Is she or is she not a liar? That's what it's about. Whether it's the claim, the counterclaim, uh, the story, everything, it all starts with trying to figure out whether or not she's a liar, whether or not she's telling the truth about her relationship with Johnny Depp and what was happening behind closed doors, on airplanes, in the penthouse, on the staircase, over in France, down in Australia. That's what this whole thing is about. And she had an opportunity and she told her story. Um, you can believe it, not believe it, but like any other witness in any other trial. They need to be tested. That's the way our system works. Tested on cross-examination. That's why we don't allow hearsay. We don't like these statements from outside of the courtroom to be used as evidence because we want this evidence tested. We want it challenged. And that's what began today in Fairfax County, Virginia. Camille Vasquez for Johnny Depp uh, stepping up to do the cross-examination of Amber Heard. And um, Came out of the box aggressive, but not over the top aggressive, right? Um, doing a battle. It's a battle inside that courtroom between these two. It absolutely, absolutely is. But here's uh, what I want to play for you right now I think is crucial here. Because when you're challenging someone, if you have something that contradicts what they're saying, you need to confront them in the courtroom in front of the jury. And, and that happened. It absolutely happened up to interpretation, right? You can, you know, because we're talking about the pictures. It's where Amber Heard is confronted with the pictures. Do the pictures match what she is describing, what she is testifying to? What, what she is saying under oath is the truth. Do the pictures support that? Johnny Depp and Camille Vasquez and their team believe these pictures absolutely contradict what she's saying. You can make up your mind, and ultimately seven jurors will make up their mind. Let me show you what happened on cross-examination. And you testified, quote, you don't know how many times he hit you in the face. That's correct. Okay. So Mr. Depp hit you in the face multiple times while he was wearing rings on this occasion, correct? Which occasion in March are you referencing? You weren't The specific. testimony that you gave on day 15 of this trial, March of 2013. You testify that Mr. Depp, quote, whacked you in the face. That's correct. And you went to the bathroom after that, right? I did. And then, according to your testimony, when you came out of the bathroom, Jerry Judge, Mr. Depp's security guard, who's passed away, pointed out that your nose was bleeding, right? He did that in the hallway. And you said you hadn't known that your nose was bleeding until Jerry Judge pointed it out to you? Yes, that's correct. I was unaware until he brought it up to me. I didn't see it when I was in the bathroom, but I wasn't looking. So, so it's your testimony that you went into the bathroom and didn't look in the mirror, which I assume was in the bathroom, to notice that your nose was bleeding? 
That's not why I went into the bathroom. I went into the bathroom um, crying. I, I don't even know if I paid attention to the mirror. I certainly didn't enough to notice any blood. And you didn't take any pictures of your bloody nose either, did you? I did not. But pictures were taken of you in Russia, though. Isn't that correct? Yes, that, that's correct. We had a press or a dinner. And this is you and Mr. Depp in Russia for the Lone Ranger premiere, correct? It was a dinner function. You don't have any visible injuries to your face, do you? None that you can see. This is a picture of you and Mr. Depp at the event the night after Mr. Depp allegedly whacked you in the face so hard you thought he had broken your nose. He did whack me in the face, and I did think it broke my nose. These are pictures of you on the James Corden show on December 16th, 2015, right, Ms. Hurd? They look like freeze frames, um, like screen grabs, stills. They're not like a, it's not like a photo shoot, it doesn't seem. But on the James Corden show, correct? From that appearance, yes. Yeah. That's a photo of you opening your mouth on the right, right? That's correct. And again, an, a, a larger view of the same photo on the bottom. That's correct. With a split lip. You've seen pictures of it without makeup. Yes. So you had a split lip when you I were sure moving did. your mouth that way. I sure did. In those photographs. Absolutely. This is big. This is big, and it happened towards the beginning of the cross-examination um, in a relatively rapid fashion, going after Amber Heard and trying to, again, undermine her credibility. She's describing one thing, we're looking at pictures, and it's telling us something else. This is a problem. This is probably the strongest part of the case uh, for Johnny Depp in trying to prove to this jury that she is a liar about this physical abuse. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Al Wunsch the third there in front of all of his law books. In Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, makeup. I mean, that's that's what that's what Amber Heard's going with. And and you know, I wear makeup and and I've covered some things up. I don't know if I'm I'm covering up a little couple little things tonight that you may or may not be able to see. So makeup can cover things up. Al Wunsch, how how, did, how is this how is this playing for you right now? That all these beatings well, <clears throat> at the hands, literally the hands of Johnny Depp, are able to be covered up with makeup, so you would never ever know. Well, you know, Vin, I am a proponent of of morning spackle, uh, which is what I use every morning. And what people don't know, I actually have a full mustache, and this is the <laughs> Cesar Romero strain, so that you can't see the mustache. That's how good my makeup is. So, you know, I, I have no problem with that. She's a professional m artist. She deals with makeup all the time. She can make anything look good. She also can make anything look bad. So she says she got hit. She says that there was an issue. Uh, who might have doubt? And if she's got the makeup and the makeup goes on and, it, it, you know, she's able to look good, God bless her. She's got great genes. She's got great skin. And she's got the ability to, to cover. And like I said, morning spackle works for me every day. Darnell Crossland, a man who needs no makeup. Um, do, do you think the jury, again, now let's remember who the jury is. Let's remember who the jury is. Young and male, for the most part. One older gentleman, three women. Uh, one is younger Two, I think one is not young, but not old, and one is wearing a mask. So you, you're going to have seven out of the nine, but is the jury going to buy that she's able to cover up these broken noses and these busted lips, and you're never going to see um, any of these injuries? And again, it's to her face at the hands of Johnny Depp, and if you ever see Johnny Depp's hands, he's always wearing at least three, four, five rings. I, I say absolutely not. Um, so the idea here is that Amber uh, is presented with these beautiful photos, um, and she looks gorgeous in these photos. And somewhere in those photos, she wants us to believe that she's borrowed Al's speckle or speckle, um, and that she's speckled up this morning. 
and uh, and she's hiding Johnny's right hook with those big rings that he wears. And I'm just not seeing. I, I don't know how much speckle you could put on to hide those uh, swollen, bruised uh, punt from those punches. And so um, I'm not. And and also, she never said that. If you look at the right side of my face, it's swollen, and I covered it. She just said maybe. And she's very um, like one of your experts said in the earlier segments I was watching. Um, she shrugs her shoulders and she's sort of saying it could be, it's possible. She never says specifically. And so I'm not buying it. Okay, Jennifer Brandt, um, to me, the, the, if you just listen to her words and describing the attacks, they are brutal. And I'm not just talking about the sexual assault down in Australia. I'm talking about the various times in different places, and it's, and it's always Johnny going after her face. It's always her face. It's amazing that she looks as good as she does, Vinny, because if he really banged her up like she talks about, you would have to see not only some bruising, but swelling, uh, some redness. I mean, Al may have some really great makeup, but I don't see Amber Heard using that. Um, she said she doesn't talk about getting her makeup professionally done by you know, a makeup person on the front, like from a movie set who can cover things. Um, she talked about having a compact, or her lawyer mentioned having her having a compact um, at the beginning of the trial, um, which is just regular cover-up makeup. And anyone who's used it, um, while you might be able to cover some things, if you're beaten and, you know, she was hit in the nose and said, you know, she almost broke her nose, I think that would show. And it doesn't look like she's injured in any way there. And I don't think any makeup could make her look that good. Um, and cover up the bruises that she describes. No way. Al, and, and it's more than once that she's described, um, I thought I broke my nose. I thought, or not I thought I broke my nose. I thought Johnny broke my nose. You know, felt like my nose was broken on more than one occasion. Um, to me, that's, that's severe. That's not like, it, you're not going to break a nose from a slap. That's got to be from, from real force. That's what she's describing. The only person whose nose I've seen banged up here was Johnny Depp when she hit him with a can of the, the um, mineral something, whatever it's called, the, from down on the island there that's used for the paint. Anyhow, I've seen that on Johnny Depp's nose, but I, I, I still, I haven't seen it. It's more than once we're talking about, I thought I, he broke my nose. What? Well, well. She, she is clearly exaggerating, but you can get hit in the nose and get stunned, okay? She doesn't strike me as a tomboyish type. She doesn't strike me as a, as a woman that played... I don't know. Hockey. On the James Corden show, she d described herself as being from Texas, and she wasn't into ballet and all that stuff. You, should, you know, she's relatively tall. I, I, but see, I think she did that just because of the role she was trying to play. But, you know, with regards to the type of person she is, you hit somebody in the nose, you can stun them, and they could think they had broke their nose, and they didn't, okay? And it's just, you know, you get hit, your eyes water, and, and you think you did worse damage than you actually did, okay? And, and like and in this type of a situation, I think that's what happened. I think that she is melodramatic. We've, you know, we've all seen that. She comes across as, as being a little too vociferous with regards to descriptions, and she can't bear it or, or demonstrate it clearly with the uh, pictures that are there, but there is injury there. I mean, you know, there was definitely okay. injuries. Okay, all, right, all right, Darnell, let's take what Al is saying, okay? Let's say um, there's injury, but she's embellishing on all of it. Okay, so now the jury's got to figure out, is she telling the truth? Is she lying? Like, th th I think that's kind of where we are now, right? It's like, all right, there's some injury. Is, is, is there some injury here? And if the jury believes there's some injury, but she's describing something even greater, what does a jury do with that? Well, as the judge always gives an instruction and credibility, he says that you can believe some, none, or all of what a witness testifies to. And a lot of times uh, what we're faced with is if a witness testifies falsely about one part, the jury's a lot of times left with no, no option but to discard everything they've said. So she's embellished stuff. And that's a nice way of saying lied about stuff. Then everything goes. And so I think she harms herself. I, I think Darnell's right here, Jennifer. I think that's the, the, the real danger here, right? And again, 
not getting to the issue of, okay, did he or did he not hit her, but to the issue of her credibility, because that's what is on trial here. And when it's, when it's all about whether or not you are someone who tells the truth and you come into the courtroom and, and, and where we go, and you, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and the jury thinks, well, maybe she's exaggerating a little bit here. Then, then where, where do we go with this? Like, where does the jury go with it? Because, um, you know, you're doing it in front of me? Well, how am I supposed to believe you? Right, Vinny. And I think it's also, it's not so much what she's saying, but it's also how she's saying it. Because if you listen to her on her direct examination, she was very weepy and emotional and, oh, you know, she was crying over everything and she doesn't want to be portrayed as a liar and, and all of that. And then she gets on cross-examination and boy, talk about the Texas tomboy. I think it really came out there on cross-examination. She's very tough and she's answering those questions very directly. She's not weepy anymore. She's not upset anymore. She's in her fighting mode here. And I just, to me watching it, just the change so rapid, it just, it makes her look like she's not being credible. I mean, it's hard to believe that some, I mean, we know she's an actress and I think this is a good uh, portrayal of some of her acting skills because she just switched it right off. All the crying and the upset was out the door once that cross-examination started. And boy, she sounded pretty, pretty tough there. Al, let me ask you this. Let's, let's go back to your, to, to your point that you made, which I think is a great point. If she's embellishing, right? Would, would her attorneys say, even if you believe she's embellishing, she still got abused even if you don't would you make that argument would you go there or do you or do you latch yourself onto her story 100% and say you've got to believe her story cuz she's telling the truth or do you make the argument ladies and gentlemen even if you think she's embellishing a little or she would you, would you go there Al honestly would you go I, there I, I i think i would go there and I, and i'll tell you why because i would use as a description you know, I, oh my God, I, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Oh, I saw it. It was like the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. I, I, I can't believe I just didn't drop dead at the scene. Okay, people exaggerate all the time. That doesn't mean they're lying. It means that they're trying to find the best description possible to be able to, to, be able to elicit what they were experiencing at the time of a traumatic moment. I don't see that that is a lie. All I see is that her saying that she is trying to put into words the way she felt. And if you've ever been hit in the nose, and you know, I may have played football and I've been hit in the nose numerous times, it stings. It doesn't necessarily mean it's broken. And unless you've had your nose broken, you don't know what a broken nose feels like. But you can say, I, you know, I felt like my nose was broken because I got hit and I, my ears, my, my eyes teared and, and my nose, you know, got all mucusy. That may be the way she felt. It doesn't necessarily mean she's not a doctor. She's not going to make a description, be, you know, be come in and say, oh, yeah, the diagnosis is broken nose, deviated but septum. Al, but Al, okay? why didn't she just say it then? Why didn't she just say it then? Oh, it hurt so bad when it happened, but I wasn't, thankfully, I wasn't bruised. Or I mean, that would be believable. But she doesn't go to that next step. She just, I got hit. And oh, it was terrible. And I thought my nose was broken and this, that. And then you see these pictures and she's not really acknowledging anything about it. No, it wasn't but really bruised. And I'm so but lucky the because I'm not there. What, 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 what does she have there? There's redness on her cheek. There is definitely something Looks like a bad there. sunburn to me. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's hard, uh, hard see, to say. Why, hard to say. You know, <laughs> that's why I have my, uh, you know. All right, my, when we come back. Spackle. When we come back, we're going to talk about the divorce settlement and Amber Heard being very public about, I don't want anything from Johnny Depp. All that money, donating it to charity. Well, it came up on cross-examination. That's next.
Um, Smile Direct Club. You testified under oath that, quote, the entirety of your divorce settlement was donated to charity, end quote, didn't you? That's correct. I pledged the entirety. All right, we're playing some word games now. What, what does donate mean? That, that came up on cross-examination because it, it's been very clear, right? Amber Heard saying from the beginning, um, I don't want any money from Johnny Depp. I'm going to take that money. I'm just donating it. You know, half of it goes to the ACLU. The other half goes to the Children's Hospital. $7 million. Don't need it. Don't want it. Right? Never wanted it. Never married Johnny Depp for his money. Um, let's take a look at how all of this went now today on cross-examination. As of today, you have not paid $3.5 million of your own money to the ACLU. Yes or no? I have not yet. And as of today, you have not paid $3.5 million of your own money to the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, correct? I have not yet. Johnny sued me. So as of today, you have not donated, paid $7 million of your divorce settlement to charity, right? I have not been able to fulfill those, uh, those uh, obligations yet. You wanted Mr. Depp's money. Didn't get it, wasn't interested in it. I loved Johnny, that's why I was with him. You wanted praise for donating the money, right? That's incorrect. You wanted good press. In general, one <laughs> does want good press, yes. You wanted to seem altruistic publicly. Wasn't my interest. Um, my interest is uh, in my name and clearing my name. And at the time, I was being called a liar and my motives were being questioned. I did see it as important to clear that up. I wanted to make a statement to make sure that there was not any doubt that I couldn't be labeled these things just because Johnny was a bigger star and had more publicity reach. You wanted to remind everyone of your claims of domestic violence against Mr. Depp, right? No, I wanted to move on with my life. You wanted to make those claims seem believable. They are believable. They you were You wanted believable. them to be seen, you wanted to be seen, excuse me, as a noble victim of domestic violence, I have you? never, never wanted to be seen as a victim. All right, let's bring back in our think tank. Still with us, Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt. Jennifer Brandt, family law attorney, let me ask you an important question. Because it came up today, and she seemed to be testifying. And I don't know that much about family law. Stayed away from that. That is just, that's good for you, not good for me. Um, but she said, and, and the testimony came out, that she couldn't accept nothing. There had to be something in, in the, the settlement agreement. Otherwise, it was somehow perhaps not enforceable. Like, can you divorce someone, have some sort of, I guess, non-disclosure settlement and not take anything? Is that possible? Are you allowed to do that? Or do you have to take... Of course you can, Vinny. You can agree to whatever you want to agree. If you want to agree that... And it's still, and it's still enforceable? In Why wouldn't it be? If you I don't know. Your... That's what they said in court. <laughs> they said it in court. I didn't say it. If that's your choice, Vinny, if she were, was advised properly and all the right language was in there, that she's just waiving her right to accept anything and she's not taking anything, I don't see how it would not be enforceable. She can do that if that's what she chooses to do. Nobody wants to usually do that. Usually people want to get something, um, but... And you're entitled to it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. You get married, you get divorced, you live in California, you get something. You absolutely do. Ab absolutely. Right. All right. But I, I mean, there's no reason she's, yeah. But she, she can agree to take nothing if she them. wanted to. If she wanted to take yeah. nothing, she could take nothing. Yes. A meeting and of I the minds. I don't think that's what she agreed to. No, yeah. she didn't. Uh, Darnell, let me ask you, you're a charitable guy. Um, when you donate to an organization, do you give them money or do you consider a donation just, I'll, I'll, I'll pledge, I'll give you some money. When I, when, I, when I have, when I have, when I'm a little more liquid, I'll give it to you, but I'm donating it to you now, but I'm not gonna actually give it to you now. Yeah, so so, so the, the thing here is you should give, you should be a purposeful giver. So years ago, I opened up a, a donation account as part of my law firm. And every month I put a thousand dollars in there. 
so that I know that once I put the money in the donation account, it has to go out. And so throughout the year, you get these invitations to these dinners, these bar things. And so all the money comes out of that. So I know it's never coming back to me. I put it there purposefully. So I pledge to spend it, but I don't just go out the same day. You know, a Court TV might have a charity event tomorrow and say, would you buy a table? And I'll write it out of that, that I already put in there. In this particular case, Amber Heard is parsing words. She said, I never punched Johnny, I hit him. She said, I didn't donate, I pledged. And, and that type of game playing is not going to do well with the jury. So in this particular case, when she's saying, I didn't fulfill those obligations yet, it's like saying, I pledge to donate this money when and if. And lawyers do that in contracts. So there's a condition precedent and there's a condition that comes after. So she's almost leaving this jury to believe that I'm going to pledge this money if something happens. But we don't know what, what's going to be the thing that triggers it. So it's just not coming off right. And I think the cross-examination cross really furthered that out um, pretty good today. Yeah, I, I think there's two problems. You know, you start picking apart those words a little bit. Uh, the other part is she's blaming this lawsuit for not paying the charity. But she got the money in February and months before the lawsuit was even filed. So, Al, is, is that a problem? It, which, or which is more of a problem, the timeline or saying on Danish television that you donated all $7 million when you pledged $7 million, I guess, not really donate. Donate, I think you got to actually reach in your pocket and give it up, right? Well, first point, Ben. Um, Darnell, it's the Albert H. Hornch III we are the world nonprofit organization, 400 Sylvan Avenue, Angwood Cliffs, New Jersey, 07632. It's a great event, okay. Darnell. It's Thank a great you. event. <laughs> yes. And uh, it's, a, it's a nonprofit. We are the world. And we all join hands and just cash your check. But um, the wonderful thing about what she's doing is that it is a problem. Okay. She is going to have to explain why she did it. But there are a lot of people, and Darnell is 100% correct. I see lawyers all the time, and I see organizations that are going to get these donations at a point in time, not necessarily immediately. You know, and I've seen people that have said, we're giving $1 million. And then like, I turn around, I look at the organization that I'm on a board on or whatever. And I'm like, well, we didn't get a million dollars. They go, oh, just not yet. It's like a restaurant that's open 24 but do, hours. Do you consider that a, a donation world. or do you consider that a pledge for a donation? Well, a, pledge is, a pledge can also be a donation. Ben. So, I mean, you know, it, it is a pledge, really? but it is also constituted as a donation. I mean, you can't write it off on your taxes yet. Okay. You wouldn't be able to do that. You know, ixnay, say nay, IRS nay. But you would certainly be acknowledged by an organization okay. that this money is going to be coming. All right. Bottom line, though. Bottom line. You got a, a jury. Do you think the jury thinks that she's being a little too cutesy here? And does that undermine her credibility? Get back to the beginning, right? All comes back to the beginning. This trial is about her credibility. To me, her not, Jennifer, just saying, yes, I, I wanted to donate it, but I didn't. I should have, but I didn't. And I right now, I don't have that money. But hopefully when my career continues after this trial, I'll have the money and I'm going to give it to him. I intended to, but I didn't. Wouldn't that be a better way to approach this whole thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. When she says no, not yet, it sounds like it's something she's going to do. But then when you dig a little deeper, well, she didn't do it, nor has she really pledged the money. And acknowledge, the, acknowledge that it makes her look good. Yeah, I said it publicly because it makes me look good and doesn't make me look like I'm just after Johnny Depp for his money. Because I wasn't, ladies and gentlemen. I love Johnny. That's, that's right. And she could have said that it was my intention or that's what I wanted to do. But, you know, life got in the way. I, I got sued. I had this. I have these expenses. I had, you know, whatever. I mean, I think that would be more understandable than to say, like, well, I haven't done it yet. She really didn't pledge the money. I don't think she's committed to giving that money other than saying it. And, well, you yeah. know, words I, are cheap. I, I, I had to pay my former assistant uh, $15 an hour. Um, you know, jury heard that, too, how lousy she paid. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> I thought I thought Darnell all of a sudden was talking about his assistant. No, Darnell pays much more money. I thought that was much more money. He makes a lot more money. All right, uh, Al, Darnell, Jennifer, staying with us when we come back. 
Um, we got more testimony from inside the courtroom, and we're going to tell you about another big case that we are tracking, the killer clown murder trial. Nine seven eight. And you said to Mr. Depp, quote, you can tell, you can please tell people that it was a fair fight and see what the jury and the judge think. Tell the world, Johnny, tell them Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, a victim too of domestic violence, end quote. That's what you said, right? I was saying it to the man who beat me up, yes. I thought it was preposterous. And the man you beat up numerous times. <laughs> right, Miss Hurd? I could never hurt Johnny.
Another one of those dramatic moments from cross-examination. Just getting started today. It will continue tomorrow. Court TV's coverage begins 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, make sure you tune in. And we're going to have more coming up in just a second. I just wanted to take this opportunity to tell you about another great case that we are tracking here on Court TV. It's the killer clown trial. Ted Rollins has the story. It started out as a typical day for the Warren family living on this quiet street in Wellington, Florida, an equestrian community just north of Miami. That morning, I do remember we were eating breakfast. Um, nice, calm Saturday, I believe it was. Joe Ahrens was 21 years old at the time. He will remember that Saturday for the rest of his life. It was May 26, 1990. A clown carrying balloons and flowers came to the Ahrens' door. Joe's mom, Marlene Ahrens Warren, reached for the flowers and was fatally shot twice in the face. It was uh, one of the worst days of my life. Ahrens heard the gunfire and ran to find his mother in a pool of blood. He saw the clown walk away and disappear into a white car, but had no clue who the killer was, and neither did police. The case would go cold for decades. Then, finally, after 27 years of break, advanced DNA testing led authorities to Sheila Keen Warren. Testing has evolved over time, and there were apparently some pieces of evidence that they wanted to re-examine, and they sent it to an FBI lab. And it's unclear which part of that led to the arrest, but something stuck. And that's how they were able to make the arrest. Keen Warren was living in Virginia. She was arrested and charged with first-degree murder for the shooting death of Joe Aaron's mother, Marlene Warren. I could not grieve because there was no closure in the case. Authorities suspected Sheila was having an affair with Marlene's husband, Michael Warren. Michael and Sheila eventually married in 2002. She was living with him at the time of her arrest. The trail that led investigators to Sheila Keen Warren contained many twists. One of them, a deathbed confession from John Moran, a family friend. John Moran passed away, but before he died, he shared a secret with his son, John Moran Jr. My father told me everything that happened before he died. I knew where the car was. I knew who planned it. I knew where the gun was at. John Moran Sr. worked with Michael Warren, who was married to the victim. Warren was questioned by police but never charged in his wife's murder. He was a used car dealer who was later arrested on charges of grand theft, odometer, tampering, and racketeering. Warren's friend, John Moran, told his son before he died that Warren may have had something to do with his wife's death. On his deathbed, he told me that car would get me anything I ever wanted for my Warren. Moran Jr. told detectives that Michael Warren tried to bribe him. Investigators followed up on details Moran Jr. gave them, including information about what could have been the killer clown's getaway car. John Moran Jr. said his dad told him where some of the evidence was kept. Police went diving in a Palm Beach canal where Moran Jr. says he and his father helped dump the evidence. However, investigators did not find the clown costume or murder weapon. Without that evidence, police can't make a case for murder against Sheila Keen Warren, according to their lawyer. I do know enough about this case, not from the discovery process, but from my knowledge of the case, that she's innocent. All right, folks, big pretrial hearing tomorrow. Trial date right now scheduled for June 3rd. Florida versus Sheila Warren, the killer clown trial. We'll continue to keep our eye on all those developments. Uh, when we come back, time to hear from you. Our 13th juror posted one of the evidence photos that Amber Heard posted today of her arm and her wrist, and there were some uh, uh, marks on there asking you, what does it prove? She said it was from all those cuts from the glass down in Australia. Um, we'll have that when we come back. Don't go away. As anyone can imagine, there was a lot going on, and uh, unfortunately, the violence became almost normal, it, especially towards the end. It was just, it, it, it's, it's hard to even, it's hard to say that now, but the violence was almost normal. And, you know, your brain does with trauma what it does, puts it away best you can.
Amber, could you please describe for the jury what this picture is? Uh, that is a picture of me uh, a few months. I believe this is April of 2015, so it's a few months after the March incident that happened in Australia uh, early, yeah, early March, in which uh, Johnny held me down on the countertops and my arms were cut on the glass um, and, and in that att attack. And if we could draw attention to your arm there, are those scars? The, what what uh, are those? Please describe for the jury what those are. Those are scars that I obtained while Johnny was um, strangling me and assaulting me on the countertop in Australia. Okay. So on her left arm, these marks, she's saying, are the scars from the broken glass when she is being sexually assaulted in Australia by Johnny Depp. Posted the picture on social media today asking you, what does it prove to you? What would... You know, what does this tell you? This is a piece of evidence that they held towards the end of her testimony. They believe it's important that it is significant. You can see it looks like three marks. And there, it might be four marks, three or four marks. You can see them on her left arm. You can also see a beautiful ring as well. Uh, Daphne with our 13th juror comment of the day today. The photos she entered as evidence do not contain the metadata as to when and where they were taken. I need more proof. Um, you know, it's interesting. This one picture that we're, that we're looking at right here, and there were other photos as well that Daphne may be referring to, but the, the picture that we just showed you um, did a little surfing on the Internet, and it looks like it came from the Tribeca Film Festival, which was April of 2015, consistent with what her testimony was. Um, when it all happened, but what exactly does that tell us? Let's bring back in the think tank, Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt with us. Darnell, I'll start with you. Let's, looking at that picture, what, what, what does it prove to you? What does it tell you? Uh, it looks like she has some uh, slight scratches on her um, left arm. Um, I was more interested in the beautiful ring. That looks really expensive. Um, it says more than the scratches, sure. Gail tonight. For those people who have suffered at the hands of abusers, physically and emotionally, I find her believable. Jennifer Brandt, this is um, obviously something that would be great for Amber Heard to be on the jury, uh, Gail. Um, but what are your thoughts about what we're looking at, this photo here, and these marks in April of 2015? Well, it's just, um, I mean, she definitely has some scratches or some scarring there. How that happened, we don't really know. She said that it was from the assault. She also testified the glass. That during this. She was cut on the glass yeah. while she was being right. sexually but assaulted. She, she testified that there was a lot of glass around. So the only thing that I question is that they're very linear. They seem to be in a just a small area on her arm. If there was a lot of glass around, it's just... My question would be sort of how did that get in just one spot and why is she not cut or have scarring in other places as well? I think she had testified that there was a lot of glass around her feet and on the floor, um, but she didn't show her feet or any scarring there. So again, coupled with everything else that she's been talking about and some of the inconsistencies that we've even pointed out, I just, um, I find that it's it's hard to believe anything she's she's saying because there are there are some inconsistencies or embellishments as al would say so you disagree with gail all right elaine I tonight with gail. without a report from an er or urgent care it proves nothing in my opinion could be self-inflicted and we're back to this issue of self-inflicted wounds here al and, and we've got seemingly a cross claims now of self-inflicted wounds to a certain extent uh, holy holly on this one, folks. I mean, those are clear-cut scrapes. There are cuts on her arm. She says they came from the glass. It's not her job to demonstrate that, you know, how it happened. No one seems to be able to say how it happened. Those are not clear-cut. I, I had my magnifying glass out taking a look at them, and mm -hmm. they are not clear, okay? They are jagged. 
Okay, they are in odd little places. They're not perfectly linear. Okay, and it's conducive to beings, you know, pushed on a table where there's glass. And she said there was glass around. She said there was an issue with that. We've seen pictures of broken glass all over the place. It, it was an absolute disgusting array of of terror that this woman has gone through. And it's clear cut. A person like that is not cutting herself. Okay, she's not self-inflicting for any other reason. It, it, it's absolutely abhorrent to her to have any type of blemish whatsoever. She takes so much pride in her looks there's no way if there was any type of cutting on hers it would have been brought out in the psychiatric evaluation that was done on her and i agree with darnell it's a nice ring okay so cheryl tonight i believe her she is so embarrassed to have to testify at all i think johnny has one too many yes men she wanted to keep things to themselves he is bullying her uh darnell that's kind of one of the arguments she's making that this lawsuit itself is is causing damage to her this lawsuit itself is motivated by johnny trying to make her miserable and abuse her well i'd have to tell you when you go back to law school and you 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 are trained to make arguments before the court appellate court supreme court uh you're trained to argue on brief and off brief that means for one side and the other um at this very juncture of this closing argument segment i will argue for amber the best argument she can have in closing is that she didn't bring this lawsuit. And if she really wanted money or whatever, she would have sued him. He forced her into this ring, and now she has to defend herself. And she, the best argument she can make is like you're saying, she's always been quiet. Whenever he was bullying her, she's been quiet. But now you drag me into this ring and make me spend all this money. Now I'm going to have to tell you the truth. And that's the best argument she can make in closing. And that's me arguing off break because I'm gotcha. really on Johnny's side. Yeah. And, and I think what Johnny's side would say is, well, you started this when you wrote that Washington Post op-ed. Great job tonight. Al Wunsch, Darnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt. We'll see you again. All right, folks, we'll be back. Don't go anywhere.